Uh, do we have any opening comments? Thank yeah, you. hi. Uh, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Our meetings are neutral ground, a place to hear and be heard. The Board of Commissioners is here to represent everyone in town, and we strive to be sure our decisions address the needs of all. We're all in this together. Just a reminder, only questions or statements regarding an agenda item will be entertained under citizens to be heard at the top of the meeting. All other matters will be recognized during public comment at the end of the meeting. Hey, lucky you, you're still lucky. Uh, I'm supposedly over COVID, but I'm having <clears throat> symptoms again. I just got a negative test, but I'm not gonna make this very long because I feel like nasty. So if you're not vaccinated, quit debating society, uh, debating society, get it done, please. Emergency. Uh, we had met with the three local EMS providers and tonight we will be determining uh, how we're going to move forward effective September 1st through the end of the year. Um, about navigating a clear path forward, ensuring all of our residents are served, that they're served equitably, and that it stays that way moving forward. That's a wrap. Uh, last night, the uh, Zoning Update Task Force concluded its work in uh, developing a framework to uh, which to build a new um, zoning ordinance from. I believe it'll go on to planning commission and people will get a look at it. There'll be a lot of discussions, but uh, as a two-year project, we're really happy to have that uh, part of it done. Cleanup time. Social media can be a wonderful way to stay in touch with friends, but it's not the place to get factual information. Case in point, this recent post from a local Facebook group. Despite a previous statement, the five-year plan for the Ingleside Golf Course is not actually on the agenda for tonight. But that doesn't mean, yes, right, it's not. It's absolutely right that it's not because it was on the agenda um, last month. <laughs> we had a five-year plan that was presented as a three-year plan. It was a plan that was pushed by the Board of Commissioners, created by the Golf Committee, it was presented as promise. I can say that all of us had concerns about the lack of a marketing plan, and there was a lot of work still to do on it. Anyone who wants to see it, it is. Um, it begins at 42 minutes and 12 seconds of the uh, posted video of our meeting. It ends at 57 minutes. Uh, got a lot of details that we'll go into later about the finances, but. Um, I'll just say this, in at the end of 2019, the golf fund would, had a negative balance of $561,469. As of today, um, that balance, at the end of August, that balance will be plot positive. 44,600 something. And we anticipate that end of year 2022, it'll be around $73,000. Cowan Township is open for business. Nothing is ever perfect, but it's our township, our community, our home. Look out for Cowan. We can all be a part of the solution by eagerly spreading the good news about where we live. That's it. Mark, I do hope you feel better. Thank you. All right, and thank you very much for that uh, opening comments. Uh, next on the agenda, we have citizens to be heard. Uh, first, I'll reach out to our uh, audience here at the Township Building. Any citizens to be heard on agenda items? If not, I'll reach out to the Zoom world. None at this time. All right, next on the agenda, we have presentation. Uh, for the DVR PC, the LED light project, uh, Mike Fuller. Actually, that has been moved to the next meeting. Okay, that has been moved to the next meeting. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, Lauren Smith um, with the Downingtown Library.
We can't hear anything if it's if somebody's talking. Thanks, Josh. It, is the microphone on? A little help. Hold it. it. You hold it until it turns on. Is that better, Josh? Can you hear me? Much better. Josh? Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Josh is one of our trustees, and we appreciate his service on our board. So uh, we want to thank Callan Township for their past support of the downtown library. As you well know, uh, uh, Callan Township supports two libraries, downtown library and the Coatesville library, and we appreciate that very much. Our libraries are an extremely important part of our community, but we do need funds to operate. And that's why we're here to ask for additional funds and also to make you aware of the programs from the library. Also here tonight to introduce Lauren Smythe, who is our new director. But I will, will mention that our, our goal is to have each one of our communities that we serve uh, provide at least $3 per capita to, to make sure that we have a sustainable budget. That's what we need for a number of years. We have uh, utilized our reserves and we, over the past year and a half, perhaps, uh, we've gotten away from that. We now have a positive budget. We've gotten additional support from a number of municipalities, including Cowan Township. We appreciate that. We need to continue to move forward. And Lauren will tell you about these things, but and I don't want to steal her thunder, but I will say one thing that when, when Lauren came to us and since she's been with us about three months now, she said that she's been aware of other libraries that have more facilities, more staff, and a larger budget who do not provide as many programs and services as we provide in the downtown. I think it's wonderful for our staff and our volunteers that, that work there. So I'll get off here and introduce Lauren Smythe, who will really tell you about the library. Lauren's our new director. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Is my sound check good? Okay. Josh, sounds good. Good. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Jack, for feeling out the technology issues for me ahead of time. Uh, thank you very much, commissioners, for adding me to your agenda tonight. My name is Lauren Smythe. I'm the director of the Downingtown Library, having started in April 2022. I come to Downingtown with more than 14 years of experience in public libraries, the majority of that in nearby neighboring Montgomery County. Along with introducing myself this evening, I wanted to just share a brief update on the library. But first and foremost, I want to thank the township commissioners and the count staff for your continued support and generosity of the library. You're an important partner and we wanna be just as strong as a partner to the township. So please never hesitate to reach out if we can help you to serve the residents of Cowan Township. We're just wrapping up summer, which is my main update for you. Summer is always the busiest time for public libraries and Downingtown Library has experienced one of the busiest summer reading programs I've seen in my career, particularly for a library of our size, as Jack mentioned. We had more than 1,400 people sign up for the program and we had 50 plus teen volunteers helping to make the program happen. We had a 525 people show up to our June 10th summer reading kickoff and we had more than 1,100 people go in and out of the library that day alone. We are literally buzzing with activity and we're looking forward to continuing to welcome people back to the library this fall as we transition back to full services and hope to continue to reach back to pre-pandemic levels. We're hoping that you will continue to support and help us to sustain the library. Our current goal, as Jack mentioned, is to get each of our supporting municipalities to a contribution rate of $3 per capita. $5 per capita is considered the state standard, um, but we know that this is an incremental process over time. So the goal now is $3. Um, we know, of course, as Jack mentioned, you also support our, our partnering neighboring library, Coatesville Library, and that you are served by each library. So that, you know, that $3 per capita really would be the combined number. So $1.50 per capita for Downingtown Library. We appreciate your consideration for that. And the board of trustees and I are keenly aware that as a municipality, you have many priorities and demands for your, on your budget. Um, my previous library is that for 12 years was a municipal library. So I'm, I'm very well versed in all of those discussions and all of the priorities that you have when you are working on your budget. So we appreciate that consideration. And what we'll be doing is sending a follow-up letter after this meeting in the next few weeks for you to consider um, when, with further information. So we really appreciate that consideration. 
The library is on the cusp of tremendous growth. To work to manage this growth, we hope to earmark at least an estimated $30,000 in our 2023 budget to get our staff salaries to a minimum of $12 an hour and to make other commensurate cost of living adjustments around the 2 to 3% range for the other library staff. About half of our staff currently make under $12 an hour. By fairly compensating and retaining our staff, we will be able to continue to offer high quality services while planning and meeting the continual demand for increased services that we're seeing. We know that town residents along with the township staff and commissioners support and use the library. More than 4,036 residents as of right now have Chester County Library System cards. Each card usually means services for more than one person and sometimes for an entire family. So we can't just say 4,000 people are served by that card, those cards. It could be double or more than that. In the past five years, we have seen our total library cards increase 39% to more than 9,600 cardholders as of this moment. Our programming circulation numbers also continue to grow, and all of this growth is in spite of pandemic-related closures and adjustments to services. I invite you all to visit the library if you haven't been in in a while. You will see the community re-engaging with the library, literacy, and shared public spaces. As I mentioned, for your further consideration, we'll be reaching out with the library in coming weeks from Board President Jack Hines and myself, detailing our request for support. I'm leaving copies of our 2021 annual report, although we're very close to 2023 now. Um, that is still useful information if you've not had a chance to see it, as well as my business cards. Please do feel free to reach out at any time if I can provide any further information. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to working with all of you to serve our shared community. And again, thank you for your continued support and for considering our requests. Thank you. If you, there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, thank Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you uh, commissioners, any questions? Josh, I know you have a lot to say about this. Yeah. So, um, to your it, heart. It, yeah, it is my privilege to serve on the trustee board. Um, but Lauren, could you take a minute and just talk about how adults use the library services too? Because I think there's a misconception that it's just children that use it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we certainly see many children and families in the library, uh, but we, we see adults, you know, adults with children, but certainly adults who are using the computers. Lots of times, I know we just had someone in this afternoon who's planning to come back tomorrow who is using our computers for job searching. Um, obviously, adults are checking out lots of our books, our materials, using our e-resources, uh, things like our hotspots. We have uh, hotspots available for people to borrow uh, for internet access if they need it for a certain period of time. Um, museum passes that many adults check out and use as well. And really also, I would say, a lot of our programming for adults, really, especially after the pandemic, we're seeing how people are just craving um, that community, which we know is so important for your continued health um, throughout your life um, and your well-being as a person. So um, beyond our children and teens programs, we have book groups for adults. Um, you know, there are uh, all sorts of programs. Our ESL group that meets virtually still right now, but that's a great community of people who get together. So really, um, you know, we serve adults in, in many ways as well. So certainly, you know, lots of lots of children. If you've been in the library this summer during the busy time when school is out, you'll see many, many children. But um, we're really providing support for parents and adults of all ages as well. Thank Perfect. You. But, Thank you. you know, you think of a library and all you think about is showing up, looking for that one book you want to read for the summer or so, <laughs> but there's so much more that you offer. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate that. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Can I up to public comment as well? If we have any uh, public that might have some questions about the uh, resources available here at the library. No hands raised? None at this time. Yes, very true. Yeah, Jack uh, mentioned a really great point. We are a member of the Chester County Library System, so you have access to all of the holdings of all of the libraries throughout the county, as well as, um, you know, we do borrowing throughout state systems as well. So it's really a very large collection of print and electronic um, ebooks and materials. 
Thank you. And hopefully everyone attending will uh, reach out to a library this week. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Laura. Thanks again, Laura. Thank Thanks, Jack. Uh, Ms. Denny, if it's okay, we do have a representative from the Coatesville Library, Pete. Uh, and yeah, instead of having you wait until the very end, I know you're not on the agenda, but, uh, uh, and, and I know you just had a few things to say, but. I have a few things to say. Welcome, hello board, how are you? Um, and, and your full name. Just my so name I... is Peter DeMeo from the, I'm one of the board members from Coatesville, and I'm not on your agenda. And uh, I just wanted to reiterate, because I've been in touch with you about a month ago, uh, just to uh, thank you for your donation to us this year. We very much appreciated uh, what you have given to our library and also the newsletter coverage has been phenomenal. So thank you for that. And I do want to tell you, we have a great diverse board. I mean, our board is so wonderfully diverse. It's a great group of people. And I can honestly say the staff is great. Our librarians do a phenomenal job. Our patronage is up to seven, 800 people a month uh, from, from previous. Our computer usage has increased. The upgrades, our library is totally upgraded through the whole summer, everything when you walk in, it's a brand new library. So we will be having on the 26th of October, an open house for all the municipalities that filter to us. So Shina Bathala, who's on our, our board is handling that and you'll get an invitation from her, but you'll be with, with Coatesville and East Valfield Valley, um, South Coatesville, Modena, et cetera, and all those that come. Now, this is a non-library non item, and I want to say I'm a member of uh, Our Lady of the Rosary Church, and we are hosting on September 28th, and I have an invitation for all of you. Um, and I'm working with Officer Miller from, from Callan and Miss uh, Law. Laws? Law. Miss Law. Yeah, and they've been wonderful to work with. So we're doing coffee with the Chiefs, which we're doing Callan, Coatesville, East Valley, Valley West Callan, West Bradford I went to today and there may be another two in there. And our point is to get all the communities in the western part of the county together because everybody's always been uh, doing their own thing. So we wanna put everybody together. I've gotten great response from all the police chiefs and all the township buildings and we're reaching out into the banks, the communities to come. So this is from 8.30 to 10.30 in the morning. I have an invite for all of you personally and one for the township. And it's a good way for all of us just to come and to socialize and really get everybody together. So, and thank you from the library again for everything. And I'll reiterate what they said, the librarians do a phenomenal job. So uh, wherever you go, applaud them. They, they are, there are gems in society. So thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, and once again, thank you, Lauren and Peter for coming and sharing. Thank you. Right, uh, next on the agenda, we have uh, the township solicitor, Ms. Camp. We have the Act 157 ordinance. You online? Hi there. Hi, Kristen. Yeah. So hey, Kristen. This is the tag team. It's not the 157, it's Act 167. This is the stormwater management ordinance we started talking last at the last meeting. Um, just to refresh the board's recollection, the county uh, water resources authority put together a revised stormwater ordinance that's required to comply with the state act 167 that's where that number comes from that is the stormwater management act of pennsylvania in 2013 the county put together a model ordinance that count adopted and has been following ever since the 2022 model is updates to that model ordinance um, there's not very many decisions for the count for the town board to make um, most of the ordinance you're mandated and required to adopt to be in compliance with the state law and to be in compliance with your MS4 permit requirements. Um, Aero Engineering has taken the lead on uh, modeling your ordinance to adopt the county uh, revisions. At the last meeting, we talked about some of the significant choices you have to make. Uh, the most important one is a new section 706 is being added to the ordinance that deals with the inspections of stormwater facilities. We did have some clarification and I'll let um, the, the people from ARA, they're next on the agenda. So I'll just let them jump in. I think Andrew is here. I know Casey, I think is in the audience as well. So they put together a nice memo um, dated August 17th that answered a lot of the questions that were raised at the last meeting. So they wanna jump in. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, my name is Andrew Talea. 
and I am from Aero Consulting, and I've been working with Kristen in addition to the township staff to go over the draft ordinance and talk about what it consists of. Um, and uh, specifically what we've been talking about over the past few weeks are uh, just some optional inclusions, some new inclusions, and uh, based upon uh, the last meeting, uh, there are, were a number of questions that the board had posed regarding the ordinance. Um, so I'm here to speak to some of those uh, questions um, in detail. So uh, the first question that was asked is, um, is it a requirement to uh, include inspections for 25-year uh, storm events uh, under this new ordinance? And according to DEP's 2022 standards, the answer is yes. It is a requirement to ensure that all stormwater BMPs that are constructed after this ordinance is adopted um, are inspected after 25-year storm events. So, um, so, so the answer to that question is yes. Um, and so uh, there is an optional inclusion as well, whether if the township wants to take on the responsibility of doing those inspections, the township can uh, also require the property owner to do an inspection in the event of a 10-year storm event. Um, initially, DEP wanted uh, municipalities to inspect all stormwater BMPs after a 10-year storm event, but I think after some pushback from um, some, some groups and some individual municipalities, they have uh, uh, rescinded that 10-year requirement, but they are requiring a 25-year uh, storm event uh, post-inspection by uh, either the township uh, or if the township would, would defer to the property owner. Um, but the 25 year is the minimum requirement for post storm inspections. Um, the next question was, what is the estimate for um, the township to consult out the inspections? Um, and so, uh, before I give you a you know an, an answer to that number, there is a lot that goes into that consideration of what the cost would be. Um, so the first consideration is, you know, how long does the inspection take? Is the stormwater BMP in good functioning condition. Um, if it's being maintained by the property owner and we don't find any source of illicit discharge, um, you know, we can be on site, do our inspection and off site in under, you know, half an hour or an hour uh, where, where the cost might be, but just, just ballpark a hundred dollars, you know, for somebody to go out to go out and do that inspection. Um, there are other costs associated with inspecting stormwater BMPs, such as uh, researching the property beforehand to ensure that all agreements and plans are in, in hand of the inspector. Um, if a stormwater BMP fails an inspection, uh, the uh, township, if they're doing the inspections, would have to write a letter to that property owner summarizing the inspection and outlining the remedial action that's required of that property owner. Uh, there would be the cost to potentially do a reinspection on that property. Um, and as I said before, if, if something like an illicit discharge is found, such as there is, you know, oil, you know, going into the basin or coming out of the basin or any other pollutant, that would require going through the process of documenting an illicit discharge. So, uh, you know, best case scenario, potentially we can be, you know, on site, off site in under an hour. But there are times where I've been in a basin for multiple hours doing an inspection. Um, so it, it, it can vary depending on the site, the BMP type, and the observations that are observed by the inspector. Um, and so typically what we like to do for all stormwater BMPs, um, so currently we do annual inspections at minimum of all stormwater BMPs within the township um, to ensure that they are functioning correctly and to ensure that we can credit them within the township's pollution reduction plan. Um, to uh, show that we are treating areas of the township with stormwater management. Um, so uh, typically we like to do as many inspections in a day as we can. And again, depending on what we find, we could get done 10 inspections in a day. We could get done 30 plus inspections in a day. It really just depends. Um, so uh, our plan or uh, our recommendation would be to continue inspecting all of the current BMPs at, you know, at minimum annually uh, currently, all of the O&M agreements in terms of when each BMP needs to be inspected at minimum varies. Um, so we found that at least if we do an annual inspection of each existing BMP, that helps find any major structural issues with BMPs before there's a you know catastrophic failure. 
Um, so uh, I guess in summary, you know, we can do those, you know, the township can consult those out. Um, and there's also a number of ways for the township to potentially capture the cost of doing those inspections if it chooses to uh, contract those inspections out. Um, and there's a, and every township and uh, borough does it differently throughout Chester County. Um, some municipalities choose to put it on the property owner where they, um, you know, send out a letter saying, hey, you have to inspect your BMP within a certain date. Um, unfortunately, what I think is the common theme is that, you know, compliance is minimal uh, at best. You know, I've seen compliance anywhere from 10% to 40% when putting it on the property owner where the townships or boroughs have to end up doing the inspections themselves anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, one option is to put on the property owner, but uh, if the township wants to do it internally through a consultant, um, there are options on how to capture those costs, including setting up some, some kind of stormwater fund so that whenever a, a new stormwater BMP is constructed um, after this ordinance is adopted, you would uh, determine a length of time where you would charge upfront costs, figuring out how many inspections you anticipate doing, including the um, uh, annual inspections for the first five year, tri annual inspections after the fifth year, and then anytime a 25 year storm event occurs. Mm -hmm. um, so you would, you, you know, we could, you know, update the fee schedule to account for that and set a designated um, formula for capturing those calls <clears throat> through an upfront stormwater fund over a period of time. Uh, the other option would be just to state in the O&M agreement that all inspections uh, conducted by the township to ensure compliance with the stormwater permit will be passed along to the property owner, uh, flat and simple. Mm -hmm. um, and that way you would just charge whatever the costs are, you know, doing that inspection uh, of, of that schedule for that property. Um, that would also include any, you know, inflation costs that go up and down over the course of time. Um, and then the other option would be to potentially set up some kind of stormwater fee across the board for the township. Um, based, you know, th th there's a number of ways to do that. And we could certainly help the township figure out what that fee should be. Um, but those are the three options in terms of how the township could potentially capture those costs for uh, long-term BMP inspections. Um, and so, you know, my opinion would be that MS4 is not going away. So if the township is going to take it on to do the inspection through a consultant, you know, one of those options should be considered. Um, and then the uh, final question uh, that I have here is, well, actually the third question is, um, what is the workflow that other municipalities are using to right. streamline EMP inspections? Um, again, it's, it's all across the board, but what I would, what I recommend typically um, is to have some kind of database or tracking system so that you can account for all the BMPs within your municipality, uh, track when that BMP was installed, under which ordinance version that BMP was installed, uh, the type, uh, any associated plans and agreements with that stormwater BMP, um, and also tracking uh, prior inspection results and then the next inspection date of that BMP all within a central database. Um, and then from there, attempt to streamline as many BMP inspections into as short of a time frame as possible. Um, and that would also then uh, include sending out letters to all of the applicable uh, properties that will be inspected at least three months prior uh, to, uh, to uh, inform them that we will be coming out to do the inspection. Hopefully that would uh, uh, help them do any preventative maintenance before we come out and have to do an inspection. Um, typically also with HOAs, sometimes I've even been uh, ask from HOA heads to, to be there when we do the inspection so that they are aware of their responsibilities for their uh, uh, stormwater facility. Um, and uh, once we do the inspection, uh, obviously we would uh, write any letters to any applicable parties that failed our inspection, outlining why they failed and giving them a time frame of when we uh, request that they remediate the issue. And then we would do a reinspection within that time, uh, after that time frame. And then if they comply, fantastic. Uh, we have accomplished you know, the whole point of doing inspections in the first place. If they don't, uh, the township would have the ability to levy any fines and penalties against that property owner, um, as well as within the new ordinance, it does state that if they do not uh, maintain the stormwater EMP to the uh, ordinance standards that the township can actually remediate issues and uh, bill the property owner 
uh, for that uh, uh, remedial effort. Um, so that would be my suggestion, you know, generally on how we keep track of BMPs inspections. Um, and so uh, I guess my, my last point is too, is that we are going to have a number of BMPs that are built under different ordinance regulations. So mm -hmm. uh, up until the time of when we adopt this ordinance, all of the current BMPs um, still should be inspected at least annually, in my opinion. And uh, again, that's for uh, ensuring that they function properly, but also again, because of the township's pollution reduction plan requirement. Um, but again, having some kind of central database to track all that information is you know, critical. Um, and so uh, on top of that too, the next five year cycle, which starts in 2020, which uh, will begin next July 1st, uh, we don't know what regulations could come down the pipe at that point. They they may ask us to update the ordinance again uh, with 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 new requirements for stormwater O and M. So, um, but but you know, I think the bottom line is we just need to have some kind of central tracking system to keep track of all the attributes that I described for all the stormwater bees, BMPs with, within the township. So, um, so uh, those are responses to all the questions that I have down uh, that the board provided last time. If anybody has any additional questions at this time specific to BMPs or inspection, I'd be happy to answer those questions at, at, at this time. Andrew, thank you. Uh, let me ask the board uh, commissioners, any questions on this? No. I know that's a lot to swallow all at once. I, I think the question on cost, I think Paul asked that, and we were kind of trying to gauge what the cost was going to be for the homeowner, HOA, whatever it is, per inspection. Uh, and that's what we were trying to gauge. So, I, I, Josh, it's Kristen. I, you know, obviously, it's the the engineer's hourly rate, and and I'd say an average would probably be thirty to forty five minutes. Um, at somewhere between you know ninety five to one hundred and twenty five dollars, depending on what level engineer they send out. Um, you know, high end would be, and that is if there would be severe problems high end i would say two hours andrew would you potentially i mean again if we get into illicit discharge where we find a pollutant that needs to be reported it you know it could be out there half a day potentially depending on what it is um but you know i would say typically um you know most inspections are within an hour um but uh again that's that's if we're coming out and physically doing the inspection and um you know, again, that's assuming that for the most part, that facility is generally working okay. So, um, so yeah, you know, to, to do an inspection within an hour, you know, ballpark a hundred to two hundred dollars, maybe, uh, you know, depending on you know what 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 year it is, the location, and other factors that may, uh, you know, vary the time that we actually spend on site documenting conditions of the. Okay, and then I'm sorry. Go ahead, Josh. And, and then just a, a, so I'm clear, anything built after this will have that requirement. Things built prior to that will not have that requirement, correct? Well, currently, all of the BMPs that are within the township that are built as of this date do have requirements associated with maintenance. Um, but what's different about these the BMPs that are currently built within the township as opposed to the any BMP built after the adoption of this ordinance is the inspection frequency. Um, so, uh, you know, again, most of the BMPs within the township now vary between what their own M agreement says between a year to three years. Um, whereas the new BMPs that are built after this adopted ordinance, it's all of them are at least annual inspections. Uh, Three years after, and again, the the, the twenty five year storm event is is one of the biggest uh, differences and requirements of uh, BMPs that are adopt that are uh, built after this new ordinance is adopted. Uh, you know, we will be required to go out at that frequency uh, compared to the current BMPs, where it, it just varies depending on which stormwater BMP it is. Um, and so, uh, the idea is that you know, currently Arrow, you know. We do annual inspections and we are going to continue to be doing at least annual inspections of all BMPs that are currently within the township. And, and we'll be doing that as part of the MS4 program. And, um, you know, there really isn't, unfortunately, any teeth 
to go back now and say you have to start paying a fee for um, um, you know inspection so the idea is that for any new BMP built you know potentially put in some kind of you know in inspection fee structure or fund or something to capture those costs because the frequency of inspections is going to increase for all new stormwater BMPs. Let me jump in for one second. So just so everybody's clear, the current ordinance does require inspections. It's just not a section of the ordinance that requires it. There's no section 706 in your current stormwater ordinance. And that's the new section that the new 2022 model is requiring you to adopt that either has landowner inspection at certain frequencies or municipality inspection. What Andrew was referring to, any stormwater facilities that were built after your 2013 ordinance was put in place, those property owners were required to sign an operation and maintenance agreement, which I think you guys have seen. They're, they're, um, it's a form agreement. And within that agreement, it specifies that the landowner is responsible to perform the inspection. <clears throat> but be, it doesn't, in that agreement, reference that, you know, it does say that if they fail to do inspections or if the township believes that the storm facility isn't functioning as it was designed, then the township has easement rights to go onto the property, perform the inspection, let the property owner know that it's not functioning as it was designed and mandate them to make repairs. So that language is in those agreements that's recorded against properties that have performed stormwater management facilities since 2013. But I know at the last meeting we were talking about whether you were required to go back to things built after 2013 to put these new inspection regulations that are found in section 706. The answer to that is no. So anything built from 20, really it's January 2014, January 1st of 2014 was when your uh, first model ordinance went into effect. So facilities built from January 1, 2014, up until the date that this ordinance, the new ordinance is effective, what's gonna govern and control when those facilities have to be inspected is your stormwater management agreement that was recorded against the properties. Anything that's going to be built under the 2022 ordinance will be governed by section 706 as you choose to adopt it. And we will mirror the stormwater agreement. That is still a requirement that those get recorded, but the language of how and who does the inspections and when they're done will mirror what section 706 says. So now it'll be in two different places. It'll be in the ordinance itself and in the agreement that is recorded in the chain of title. The other thing, depending on how you choose to fund this, it may be just in your fee resolution that you adopt, that you simply state, you know, pursuant to your stormwater code, any inspections that are conducted by the township of BMPs will be, you know, charged to the property owner. And then either you specify the rate or you do like what you do for consultant fees now, you know, whatever the hourly rate is, that is in place for that particular year is one way you could do it. If you choose to do some sort of upfront fund, one of the options in the county model um, recommends or suggests that one method to do it is, and we talked about this a little at the last meeting, say for example, I'm coming in and I have to do a stormwater facility on my property. <clears throat> you could, as part of the application fee, collect an upfront fee that you would then put into a fund that would account for the inspections that need to be done in the future. So that's one way to do it. I think one of the concerns about doing it that way is those costs are going to rise as inflation and as your consultant fees get higher. So you're really just sort of guessing at what that fee would be. Um, not saying it's a bad idea. It, again, that's something to think about. Again, uh, the, other, the other thing would be if you ever choose to do what you have the authority to do is to impose a stormwater fee separate and apart from your taxes, um, if that's something that you choose to go down that path, that fee could also be a source of revenue to cover these inspections. So I'm not suggesting that you need to answer the how you fund it just yet. I mean, that could be something that you do. Uh, the ordinance itself doesn't specify that you have to say how you're gonna fund it. If you choose to do it you know, through your fee resolution or through a stormwater fee, that's something that can be decided after. Um, but in terms of how, who's gonna do the inspections, that part of it does have to be decided for us to complete section 706. Thank you, Kristen. Commissioners, uh, do we have uh, other questions? No. I, I did have uh, one, as far as that, how many properties uh, are we talking about that are gonna be affected by this? And presently, you know, I, I know from this, this point forward, 
anybody that's going to have a new system uh, would be part of this. But uh, presently, how many homes or how many properties? You mean you mean truly be affected right now by the new ordinance? Yes. This would only apply to properties that build a new stormwater BMP or retrofit a uh, existing stormwater BMP to the, to to a modernized oh. stormwater BMP. So the answer would typically would most likely be none. This would okay. really only apply to, to to properties that choose to build or to retrofit a BMP after the ordinance is adopted. So all of the current BMPs would adhere to whatever their current own own M agreement states. Okay. And the Paul, was your was your Paul was your question? How many facilities have been built since 2013? Is that yes. what? Yeah, that's uh, what I thought his question was. I, I think off the top of my head, I believe we have at least 70 or 80 stormwater BMPs within the township built at different times. But okay. are they owned primarily by HOAs or by individual owners? Um, it's a mix. I don't know off the top of my head what the breakdown is, but a majority are privately owned, um, either by an HOA or, or, or a private property owner. But I. Unfortunately, I don't have that off the top of my head what that breakdown. I, I think and I, 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 I don't either, but what I would best describe it as is, you know, new developments have the O&M agreement. So it, it is not, um, if anything, basically went through a subdiv subdivision or land development process since mm -hmm. 2014, and we have an existing O&M, that is who it affects. So we wouldn't be going to, you know, Individual. Mrs. Smith's house on on ABC Street, who has been there since 1936. That's not what it is. Primarily new developments that mm -hmm. these O and M agreements exist for. Okay. But just a question to that: If Mrs. Smith added a thousand plus square feet, we would be going to her home. Correct. That is correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. And and anybody who would be adding anything to their backyard, it would be accumulation of the square footage since 2014 or 2013 I, I thought that's what we yes asked. that's right paul okay so i'm just trying to get a feel for how many folks would actually be affected by this and then and then really come up with an idea of what our costs would be you know because if uh, and how many homes we have here 4500 homes 5000 homes in in count township that's a lot of homes for stormwater fee uh, but if we're only affected to 70 to 80 as you're saying Oh, I, I think I understand your question now. You're okay. asking if, if the stormwater fee was initiated, how many homes would be affected? Right. Is that your question? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to determine. I, I think a better way to put this, and okay. this is all in the planning that we've, you know, we, we're trying to walk through and getting the GPS layers and, and things to that effect. Mm -hmm. I think moving forward, this would become a part of the cost of our stormwater annual maintenance. I think is a better way to put it. And, and essentially we would roll that process in to the total cost of the maintenance program. Mm -hmm. um, it's just initially we don't have that fee. So right. therefore we, we need to have some funding mechanism. Um, and, I, and I'm just trying to wrap my head around how much of a fee would it ultimately be? I, that, I, I think that's where I'm coming from because, you know, if it's only $10,000 for, for annual you know inspections and and that's what we we have been conceptually discussing that okay. behind the scenes mm -hmm. you know it, we have a minimal cost right now but when we are looking at the overall cost of our stormwater management in upcoming well, years yeah, there's a lot more involved here exactly yeah. so so yeah we're not talking I, I at least i don't believe we are where's casey at? we're we're not talking <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars here okay. we're, we're talking okay. a minimal <clears throat> um amount but what we're really aiming for is that in the future, if there's a stormwater fee, or as we have new O and M agreements, we are describing that in that O and M agreement. So our, our goal is not to, um, you know, create anything for current HOAs or business owners or homeowners. Mm -hmm. The the goal is is that we're trying to meet the mandates that are being put upon us. Right. Keeping in mind, if we have the residents do this individually on their own, they have to do it after every 10 year storm, not 25 year storm. So that, that was why we were leaning more towards the township doing it and using an outside consultant is to hopefully, you know, reduce the severity of that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, we aren't okay. talking a huge um, situation. Here. Okay. Yeah. I just and, want to put it in perspective. Yeah, we, we really are not. Okay. No. 
Andrew had good information. I think one of the questions was, and one of the, I would say, misperceptions is how frequently the 10-year storm, the 25-year storm occurs. Andrew, were you going to share that information? Yeah, we have some uh, new figures here. So can somebody share that with us to, for the storm events? Oh, sure. Go ahead. <clears throat> All right. Good evening, board. Uh, my name is Carl Schmidt. I work with uh, Arrow uh, Consulting as well. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Kristen. I'll uh, point out uh, some of that information. It does give perspective to uh, what we're talking about, uh, mm -hmm. and it is uh, rather interesting uh, since we're celebrating the like one year anniversary of Ida. And, uh, there'll be other conversations. Mm -hmm. on Please that. bite your tongue. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would. So. Um, <clears throat> The two storms in, in the uh, ordinance that's frequently mentioned is the 10-year storm and the 25-year storm. Uh, using information that DEP uh, publishes for stormwater modeling is what we use. Uh, and those amounts, the 10-year storm is uh, 4.57 inches. It's in the uh, paperwork we provided you. And the 25-year storm is 5.6 inches. Going back 10 years, researching through NOAA and Weather Service, and some other uh, local uh, uh, weather stations. Uh, over a 10 year period, the 25 year storm occurred once, that was last year. Um, over that 10 year period, the 10 year storm, other than Ida, occurred twice, uh, once in 2020 and once uh, in 2012 for Sandy. So it, it, it's, uh, it's a large amount of rain. Uh, it doesn't happen that frequently. When you tie these into what Andrew was presenting on the frequency once every five years, every uh, three years thereafter, or these storms, uh, then the uh, rates of going out there, if it's a complex uh, investigation or a simple observation, it all rolls up to not a whole lot of money that we're uh, trying to um, project. Uh, it's, it's hard to project when it's based on future permit submittals with their impervious that we don't have, but you know, based on uh, routine history, it's still in that same order that we've, we've referred to. Um, Kristen, does that answer the question? Give a little perspective on the frequency? Yeah, I think, you know, I, even at the last meeting, we were thinking, you know, obviously everyone keeps saying it rains a lot more now, and I don't disagree with that, but how frequency, you know, how frequent the 10 and 25 year, it's helpful to put it in perspective with that new requirement in 706, if the municipality is gonna take on the inspections, you know, did that mean we were out there 10 times last year? Or does that mean we're out there once every time we have, unfortunately, a storm like Ida? So I think that's helpful. I, I guess my question is, those numbers differ from what Al sent us earlier today. Al sent us uh, a thing I saying, uh, they're, they're, they should be in the um, same uh, magnitude. Uh, Al provided something that gives uh, a lot of different information on the intensity of the storms and the uh, frequencies. Um, again, Kristen, you can um, uh, opine on this as well. Typically, uh, when, when storms are mentioned in regulations such as permitting or this ordinance, it's a 24-hour um, cycle. So it's the 10 year, 24 hour from that chart and the 25 year, 24 hour from that chart um, that Al provided. So those should be in the, again, uh, the four and a half inch range for 10 year and uh, 5.6 uh, for the 25 year. Um, does that jive uh, with your information, Mr. Evans? It was, it was me, Josh. Sorry. Oh, sorry, um, Mr. Young. So you're saying in the table, it's a 24 hour period, not what Al is saying, the three hour period. Uh, correct, it's um, it's not defined in the ordinance, but typically it's 24 hour. Uh, we, we don't get to pick the intensity of five minute, uh, one hour, eight hour uh, or 24 hours. It's, it's typically the 24 hour uh, when they when they reference these storms. Josh, one of the things I, mean, I talked this, this afternoon was that I think we do need to reach out to the county and I think the county ordinance does not, at least where I've, what I've read, it does not specify whose data we're supposed to be using to determine if, what the frequency of the storm is. I think we do need that to be clear. And I think we actually want to add that to the ordinance so that even though, you know, we might learn that today, 
We want it to be in the ordinance that there's no question as to whose data we're using. And I think that the issue that you guys are talking about over what time event, it's also important to nail that down. And the county, I think the county will have an answer to that question. Yeah, because what, what scares me a little bit is typically. So that means that it's open to interpretation. So if we can make that very clear in the yep. ordinance, that way people know what they're doing because you get a new person in charge of stormwater, they could say, no, we're using the 12 hour data. So I, I just wanna make sure that that's very clear. Great point. And then Kristen, is that something that needs to be done by September 30th or is that something that can follow up? No, I think I'll reach out. I'll reach out tomorrow. I mean, the gentleman that I work with, I'm forgetting his name right now. When I had questions on this model ordinance, he answered me the same day. He was very, very helpful. I want to say his name was Corey. Um, I think there's probably a question that's been asked by other municipalities. So I, I have a feeling he'll know the answer right off the top. If not, I actually have a call scheduled with Jan Bowers. Um, who used to be the head of the Water Resources Authority from the county on an, another matter next week, and I can always raise it with her as well. But I do think we should get clarification and insert it into the ordinance. Good. I think that's easy enough to do. Mm -hmm. But I guess we're looking for guidance. I think really Section 706 is the biggest you know, missing piece of the puzzle in terms of finalizing this to get it before you for authorization to adopt. Um, I don't know if you guys, what, what your thoughts are. If you Sounds like your staff and and want, wants you know the option to have the municipality perform the inspections, um, and in terms of how you fund it, that can be something you can continue the dialogue on. I, and I did have one other question about this. Uh, you had mentioned Andrew. You had mentioned the illicit uh, discharge. Um, <clears throat> if that was found, is there fines involved, or is there? Uh, yes, there is. I can answer that. The, okay. the ordinance the ordinance already has that section in the illicit discharge and there are fines and penalties a violation and penalty section just like most of your ordinance so so there are there are mechanisms to issue notices of violation and issue fines okay and, and just uh i guess if i'm a property owner and, and i have illicit discharge but i think it's coming from my neighbor is that also addressed yeah i mean typically what we do is we one identify what the discharge you know um, you know, typically, you know, especially in Chester County, there are dry weather flows where you look at a storm pipe and there is something coming out, whether it's just spring water, excess storm water left in the system, or a true illicit discharge where it's, you know, household chemicals or, um, you know, runoff from agriculture. But, you know, the process is typically identify what the discharge is, is it illicit, um, and then from there, uh, following the storm system up the uh, upstream uh, flow and trying to identify is it coming from a uh, inlet um, and trying to identify who the responsible party is. Um, so yeah, just because you find an illicit discharge in a storm base and it's not necessarily from the property owner of that storm base and it could be from your neighbor washing their car in their driveway or it could be from so, you know a commercial business that is inadvertently or inadvertently dumping something within the storm system. Okay. Appreciate that. Commissioners of Trey Stackhouse, just just a quick input on that, just so you know that, I mean, we we do, you know, that occurs now. We, you know, on multiple occasions, we've written uh, notices of violation for illicit discharge. You know, a lot of times it could be, you know, somebody uh, draining their pool into the stormwater system uh, that they haven't dechlorinated, or somebody hasn't maintained their basin. Um, you know, has a maintained their basin properly. So we, you know, we currently do that based on our existing ordinance. Thanks for that input, Ray. All right, commissioners, any other questions? Because I, I did see a hand raised from the public. Miss Spalding? Yes, Miss Spalding. Sorry, I just had one question. I, you were talking about residents and I understood what you were talking about there, but this ordinance does apply to commercial industrial properties as well, correct? Uh, to every property. It doesn't matter what your zoning classification is. Okay. It matters what level of impervious cover you add or what level of earth disturbance you conduct. Okay, then following up that, uh, my question is uh, projects that are, this is gonna be passed um when they they're supposed to adopt it by september 30th 
So okay. likely it will be at one of the next meetings, either one of the one of the meetings in September we're shooting for. Okay. Projects that have already been um, submitted. So things like the Kmart, the apartments, the commercial properties that have submitted their projects but don't have approval, are they subject to this? No, they're subject to the 2013 ordinances. So they're grandfathered under 2013. Right, but there's not really that, there's not, there's actually not very many significant changes. They okay. are still required to do very significant stormwater management. And okay. in terms of the level of um, management, it's, it's virtually the same. The only real significant difference is this new section 706 in terms of the, you know, municipality taking on the inspections and what frequency the inspections must occur at. But those plans that are in the works right now will still be required to implement and install stormwater management facilities, and they will be required to record a stormwater management operation maintenance agreement that will specify that for the, I believe what your current agreement says is for the first three years after it's constructed, they need to do an annual inspection. And, and as Mr. Stackhouse indicated, you know, if, if the township ever learns that a stormwater facility that was built basically any time, even something was built in the 80s or the 90s, if it's not working properly, and he does get those calls, the township goes out and performs an inspection and sends notices of violation. Maybe not of the ordinance, but old recorded subdivision plans have, you know, in some instances, they have notes on the plan that require the facilities to be maintained. So okay. just because you know, your grandfathered in under a prior ordinance doesn't mean there's not enforcement mechanisms for, for the township. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. All right, uh, any other questions? All right. uh, Ms. Camp, uh, are, is this something that uh, we just need to give you, I guess, uh, direction? On yeah, I guess, I guess if, I'd like to know if the board's comfortable with the option where the municipality is the one performing the inspections. Well, let's take a census. Uh, all in favor of having the township uh, manage the inspections? Say aye. 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 All opposed? Yeah, Mark, you're muted. I'm not sure if you were. Aye. <laughs> yeah, he raised, we saw him raise his hand. Oh, okay. okay. All right. uh, five zero. All right. So uh, what we'll do is we'll put that, we'll put that uh, provision in, in section 706. Andrew, was there anything else in terms of finalizing the ordinance that we need? I don't believe there was anything else we needed input from them on. Uh, no, I think all of the outstanding questions were specific to uh, that section and mm -hmm. how to handle inspections uh, and who's responsible for those inspections. I mean, the only other thing that I would say is if the township also wants to require, uh, so if the township is doing 25 year storm inspections for all BMPs under this new ordinance, do we want to optionally require those property owner owners to submit inspections if there is a 10 year storm event? Um, it is not a requirement. It is just something that is, is, is an option that the township can include as well. I, I think that we are <laughs> enough onus on, on property owners with the 25 year event. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be in favor of that right now. I don't know the, uh, commissioners, any other comments on that? No. I don't, don't think it would be necessary at this point. Understood. Okay. So Kristen, we can work with you um, and continue the dialogue about how we want to structure the, the language on the fee and the reimbursement. But as far as the ordinance, why don't we put the final version together? I think we're there pretty much, but distribute it to the board in their packet for the next meeting. So the action item at the next meeting will be to authorize advertisement for adoption at your last meeting in September. Okay, thanks, Does that Kristen. Does yeah, that work? That's okay. more than fine. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. All right. Next on the agenda, uh, Ms. Denny, we have an MOU for Teamsters Union. Uh, yes, we had discussed an executive session a few weeks ago. Um, you know, the issues of the whole world is having hiring people. Um, currently in the Teamsters contract, when we have a new hire, they would be hired at a 75%, 85%, 95%, and in the fourth year, they would get to their full wage. 
um, we had gone to the Teamsters and, and urge, especially to get CDL drivers, and especially in preparation for the winter, um, we are proposing that we skip the, the wage scale steps just until 1231 of this year to try to recruit CDL drivers. Um, they were amenable to that, and, and I had forwarded an email this evening before the meeting um, showing the language of the MOU and um, just wanted to get the boards okay to move forward with this MOU. Okay, and, and this is just for the remainder of the year? Yes, I and, this... and my thought process is, and that is, is we are really putting a full court press on to try to get the CDL drivers in before winter and the storm snows. What we often get is guys who want to try to work the construction season as long as they can and maybe in February they'll come work for us um, we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to get them in before the end of the fall. Uh, and no issues once January 1st comes around that we go back to the normal? No. If we need to renegotiate, we'll, we'll renegotiate an MOU. But at this time, that's that's the, the uh, plan of attack that we're, we're taking. Considering the labor market today and trying to uh, recruit Ooh, folks, yeah. uh, hopefully it's beneficial. Commissioners, uh, any questions on this? You just needed approval from us? Yes. Right. Yeah, that's good news. All right. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Yeah. Looks good. Five zero. Just good a life. point of information. Uh, it looks like we have one of our favorite old Zoom bombers on again tonight. So uh, before calling on anyone, take a good look at that name. Do not share it. <laughs> okay. No, I learned my lesson Martin. last time. <laughs> Next on the agenda, uh, we do have a tabled uh, ordinance that uh, maybe we can finally untable. The consideration to approve the resolution 2022-04 designating the 2022 response territories for the emergency service in Count Township. Uh, commissioners, I if we're interested in uh, bringing, the, uh, bringing this back for discussion, uh, can I get a motion to untable? So moved. Moved. Second. second. Moved by Commissioner Evans, second by Commissioner uh, Kennedy. All in favor, say aye. 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 This is good. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, resolution has been uh, untabled. Um, start some uh, conversation. I know uh, if you guys had noticed uh, there was a change on the resolution uh, keeping the Washington hose as our provider for basic life uh, service or support uh, for the west side of Municipal Drive and still keeping Minquist Fire Company as our uh, BLS service for the east side of Municipal Drive. Uh, but there was a change uh, switching over to uh, the AVL system for the advanced life support for, I guess, for the entire township. Of course, Minkwas does have the AV, uh, ALS service. Uh, I, I believe uh, Washington Hose is not equipped as of yet after our discussion. So, uh, comments from the uh, commissioners? Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of going with with what I learned at that meeting, but the three um, providers that, that, that presented, uh, not one of them was in favor of going to um, AVL at this point. Um, possibly a little further down the road as more bugs get worked out. But um, I, I, I don't know that, I, I definitely don't think that that's the way we should be going on this. Um, I, I like Washington Hose on the west and Minquist uh, on the on the east. And uh, I know Washington Hose said that they could uh, probably be ready for ALS in the new year. Uh, Minquist is available now at no cost. Um, this is something we're going to have to get right back into after budget season or during budget season to figure out how we're going to land for the for 2023. So um, I, I think that we, 
we 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 let Minquist do the uh, uh, ALS for the for the rest of the year. Will we be discussing fees at that time later in the year? Or? I, I would assume during budget season we may we'll be, be entertaining. That. And I'd, okay. Yeah. No, it'll all be for 2023, not... Uh, 2023? Okay. Yeah. And I did speak with Minkwist today, uh, and they are amenable to providing ALS service for the entire township and say they are ready to do that as of now. So with that, I would make a motion to amend the resolution uh, 2022-04 to change... Uh, from advanced vehicle locator on ALS support to uh, Minquist to provide advanced life support for the entirety of the count mm -hmm. uh, uh, my, my question there would be if Minquist, uh, now granted, and just to bring everyone up to speed, we do have Washington Hose with a substation uh, behind the giant supermarket and Minquis has moved into the Thorndale Fire Company yes. um, and they both located themselves in a perfect spot in the center of our town so that yes. definitely we have help that will arrive on time either side hmm. um, with the advanced life service the ALS uh, of course uh, was it Westwood that did their presentation as well they're coming from the north end um, can, can we be assured that Minquis would be able to carry our whole township quicker than having a Westwood or any other service available on the east side? And so just I, a, live on the, I live on the east side. So we, just a, right a, a quick point of order. So I made a motion. There either needs to be a second or the motion dies. And that has to come before discussion. No. Oh, okay. Second. All right. Move in the second. So I, I talked to, to Minquist today, and they now are um, ready to, uh, they, they've just staffed up and said they are ready to provide service to the entire township. Um, and like Mark said, I think we, we, we can move on this today, solve the problem with uh, Medic 93 leaving on September 1st. Um, if Minquist is not available or, or not ready, then the ALS system kicks in on the second call anyway. So Mr. Young, just for clarification, is this both for ALS and BLS? So ALS, it would change the bullet point that says advanced life support shall be provided by Minquist Fire Company. Okay, I, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that I know I'm changing the right part. So basic life will stay as is. Correct. Yes. We're divided at municipal and just for advanced life will go to Minquist. Correct. Okay, that's fine. Just want to make sure I have it right. And I think we we need to dive back into discussion with Washington Hose to see if they're actually going to be ready for the fall yes. and what that cost may be um, and, and make a decision from there. But, you know, this is something that we can't then kick down the road again for another year. Absolutely. Uh, we did have a hand raised from a resident. <clears throat> Ms. Spalding? Yeah, I just wanted to be sure I understood what you said. I, and, I, and I commend you for, A, covering the whole township. Um, I've been trying to keep an eye on what's going on with the um, hospital situation because of several family members who are having mm -hmm. problems and going back and forth to hospitals. Um, it doesn't look like there's anything in the works that I've seen or perhaps you've heard of that's going to alleviate the loss of Brandywine. That being said, uh, I think you're wise to say you need advanced life support. Nobody can tell what's going to happen when you get these people and they're going to have further to go. It's, it's the sad reality of, of the moment. But if I understood what you proposed, Josh, you're saying advanced life support goes across the whole yeah, so Minquist would provide service for the entire township okay. instead of the AVL system, which would just be anybody driving by okay. um, or in, in a closer location. Okay. Uh, I think it 
it just it these companies need to build a business model that they can operate and continue to operate out of and sure. i think that that would allow that again we can make that we can make a change at any time this is a resolution so we just need to to make that change if if for some reason uh Manquist can't provide that we can change that service at any time yeah um, i was just hopeful we'll have the coverage because i can tell you when you pick them up you can't tell what's going to happen <laughs> yeah so this, the this door is, and the hospital and i would just say that I, I know county officials are working as hard as they can to to find a buyer for for brand new hospital they did so in the south um yeah. with uh Jennersville. So th there are people working extremely hard to try to find a buyer to get us uh, a hospital reopened. I'm aware. It's just the, the problem is between now and then. But thank you. I, yeah. I agree. It sounds good. And I think I think with the reopening of Jennersville, it'll take some pressure off of Chester County uh, and Paoli. So I, I'm hopeful that, you know, once that's up and running, maybe some of these wait times will come down. Um, Chester yeah. County, for instance, was handing out numbers to the yeah. people who came in, some of whom had heart attacks. So, you know, it's getting, <laughs> it's getting dangerous out there. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. All right, any other comments on this? We, we do have a motion and a second. I will ask for a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? And motion's good, 5-0. Uh, Miss Denny, if we can just make those changes on uh, this resolution, Absolutely. just a bit. All right, uh, and just just to uh, reiterate, if uh, Minquis is not able to uh, cover the ALS, it does go AVL. That's just part of this whole uh, process. So uh, someone will be at your home to take care of you. And same thing on basic life support too. If if somebody if either Washington O's or Minquis is not available then it does go AVL on the second call. All right. All right. Thank you, commissioners. I don't want to see that again until January, okay? And I don't want to hear any more A-V-L-S-Y-B-S. -S. I mean, that was like yeah. getting all that, <laughs> the letters straight was like, what? <laughs> all right, next on the agenda, uh, minutes to approve. We have the July 28th minutes. I think uh, Commissioner Evans had some comments. That's why we held it up from the last meeting. Any changes or you'd already passed that along? Uh, they, they, yeah, Denise sent them out. I sent them to Denise and she sent them around. Oh, okay. All right. Well, if there was no other uh, comments on it, I'll entertain a motion to approve uh, July 28th minutes. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Kennedy, second by Commissioner Tendero. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion's good, 5-0. We have the minutes from the August 11th meeting, for a Board of Commissioners meeting. Any questions, additions, corrections? If not, entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Aye. Moved by Commissioner Tendero, second by Commissioner Kennedy. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion's good, 5-0. Minutes have been approved. Uh, we have minutes to acknowledge for uh, the approved planning commission uh, meeting minutes of June 21st. Everyone had a chance to take a look at that? Yes. We're good. I'll yeah. entertain a motion to approve. So moved. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Kennedy, second by Commissioner Tendero. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, minutes have been uh, approved. Moving mm -hmm. on to the financial department, Ms. Swan. Actually, you... be before we move oh, on to Ms. Yes. Swan, and I, I apologize, um, Casey Lalonde is here to, and he, he has an update on all of our projects. And oh. I, I'm sorry, we got oh, so great. excited with storm water. We, oh, yes. we, we Casey. skipped right yes. through them, and I, I apologize. So before, you know, not that, you know, we don't want to hear Ms. Swan's finances, but I figured. No, know, no, that's fine. Thank I, you. I, did, I didn't want to interrupt because I know how meetings go along. You went to one or two. Uh, just a few. Just a few. <laughs> uh, good evening, commissioners. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I just wanted to provide an update to all the various projects that we're working on in the, in the township. They're all capital projects. I've given you um, a three-page handout showing um, either related projects 
uh, non ida related projects, and then just general stormwater projects that, that we're working on currently for you. So I'll just run through them quickly and just ask questions as, as they come up. I'll just okay. do this briefly. Uh, so for Hurricane Ida projects, uh, the Board of Commissioners has authorized North Barley Sheep Drainage, Barley Sheep Swale, North Bailey Road, and the South Lloyd Avenue Stream Bank projects to proceed to bid. We should be bidding those later this month or early into September. And again, we're shooting for project completion by 1231 on a majority of these projects. Mm -hmm. The other two big projects we're working on are Poor Municipal Bridge out front and Moore Bridge. We are going to be appearing at the September 8th uh, commissioners meeting with about 99% complete plans. We're gonna ask for permission to move ahead to bid so we don't miss the next uh, so we don't have to come back on the, on the, uh, at your uh, last meeting of the month so we can get the bids out. Uh, we're projecting a um, bid completion, uh, I'm sorry, uh, project completion probably early next year, but well before the March 31st deadline of 23 to get the projects done. Uh, we have several projects completed. Fisherville Road Stream Bank is done and Municipal Drive Stream Bank is done. South Floyd, I'm sorry, um, I think that's it for Hurricane Ida. Um, okay. Moving on quickly to the non-Hurricane Ida projects. Uh, we have your 2022 road paving project starting in September. That was awarded to Long's Asphalt. Uh, we have a September start for that. I believe they're gonna start um, some of the base repair work uh, the Tuesday after Labor Day, and then we'll start with paving in earnest right away. The Reed Street stormwater project that's been hanging around a little bit too long for my, for my taste. We are in final design. I'm also gonna be working with the various property owners for easements. Uh, we need at least four easements, but then also along Reed Street itself, um, we will, will most likely enact several more easements uh, to install the stormwater piping. Uh, so we're very close to final design on that. We'll be presenting that hopefully at the September 8th meeting as well. East Fisherville Bridge Demolition. Uh, we did the pre-construction, uh, well, pre-demolition meeting last week, uh, and we expect it to start in about 10 to 14 days. We're looking at about a three week demolition project and that'll be done. So we should have that done by the end of September and, um, and build by the contractor. So we'll, we'll close that out early October. Lloyd Avenue signals, obviously they're up and running. I've been there multiple, multiple times. They're working great. I think it's a great improvement to the intersection. The 258 Horseshoe Drive demolition project is underway. Uh, the utilities have been capped. We're still working, I think on the water service, uh, but we definitely expect uh, probably end of September completion for that project as well. The Spackman Par, uh, Farm dr uh, driveway paving is included in your 2022 road paving. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, that's gonna commence in early September. The Cowan Park Bioswell project, uh, I've included a separate sheet on that. The project is complete. Uh, and the Bioswell project is essentially designed to improve stormwater quality. It, uh, through the plantings that are done, with the, it's a very specific seed mixture for bioswales. It, it pulls out phosphorus and nitrogen out of the stormwater and also drops out some sediment to uh, create better water, water quality. The job is complete. We're waiting for the application for payment for the contractor. Uh, and that should be within the next week or so. We'll present that to the board for payment uh, very soon. And lastly, we have uh, just general stormwater projects that were uh, under design, Geo Carlson Culvert, Humpton Road Culverts, Lynn Boulevard, one and two, Park Drive Stormwater Project and the Williams Way Culvert Project. And also we're looking at the Bondsville Culvert right down the street here. We're in final design on all those projects and we will bring those to you as soon as they are ready to go out to bid to get authorization for bid. So that is a quick five minute update on the hmm. multitude of projects we have working on here in, uh, awesome. in the township. Any questions? I know that was a lot. If you do have any questions after the meeting, just obviously get with Kristen and we'll get those answers to you about any of the projects. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. All right. I guess we can go back to the finance department. Ms. Swan, how are you tonight? I, I can't talk quite that fast, but I'll <laughs> try to move it along a little a lot bit. Of information. <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> Just a couple of things to note. Um, we are in the midst of uh, changing the payroll services to ADP, and that is moving along. Mm -hmm. uh, that should happen either fourth quarter or beginning of the year, 2023. For uh, residents, just a reminder, 9-1, uh, September 1st, 
trash and sewer bills will be mailed out, uh, payment due by 925. Don't forget the payment options, um, auto debit from your bank account or online payments, as well as the drop box outside or our finance window and also the good old US Postal Service. Um, our audit is complete for 2021 and uh, representative from Maylee will be here September 8th, which is the first meeting of September to present that. Um, after reviewing the report, I don't expect anything um, out of the ordinary. Um, it should be a, a good report that the, the board would be uh, happy with. Uh, lastly, we have the 2023 budget preparations underway. Um, directors, I'll be meeting with you uh, probably by the end of next week with packets. And that is my finance report. All right. Thank you, Thank Lisa. You. Thank right. you. Commissioners, any questions on it? No. All right. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, motion to approve the general check run is 48697 to 48714. I don't see any manual checks, so uh, all in favor to approve the check run? We need a motion. Oh, yeah. Aye. Um, motion? So moved. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Tendero, second by Commissioner Kennedy. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. Motion is good. 5 0. Give us some checks assigned. Okay. Uh, moving on to the mean potatoes, director's report. And we have uh, Police Chief Elias. Welcome. Hi, Chief. Sorry for coming in late. But I was here with you in spirit. <laughs> we knew that. 7 30. Um, uh, something I wanted to mention from the uh, July monthly report we investigated two accidental firearm discharges in parking lots in the township in August. Uh, the mm -hmm. latter almost cost a three year old child his life. Channel 6 covered the story. They were out here. They interviewed me. One, one thing that I discussed during that interview, unfortunately, they didn't air, and, and that is this. So only about 40% of all legal gun owners have taken a firearm safety course. If you're a first-time hunter, you're required to take a hunter safety course. If you apply for and obtain a concealed carry permit, there is no requirement to take any safety training mm. on the safe handling, storage, or transport of a firearm, which I know it sounds outrageous, but it's yeah. it's true. So I would strongly suggest to anyone uh, who, especially if you're a first-time gun owner, to please just take a firearm safety course. Um, there are just some very basic things that first-time gun owners don't realize, like keeping your finger out of the trigger guard unless you're unless you're ready to shoot. Um, and that's what happened in one of the two instances that I'm I'm referring to here. I'm not anti-gun. I'm just pro-responsible gun ownership. So, I know uh, Commissioner Evans mentioned something about this at last month's meeting because the. One of the shootings had just occurred two days before that meeting, mm -hmm. um, so I will leave it at that. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Uh, an update on on police hiring. The three police applicants that you issued conditional offers to, they all started on on Monday. Right. Oh, great. Um, so this week has been training on policies and equipment and use of force, and Monday they'll actually hit. The streets with their field training officers and the field training program is roughly four months um, on average if we hire an officer who already has experience and they're they're doing well there are different milestones along the way if they meet those they could end the fta program a little earlier one of the three officers that we did hire had experience two of the three are, are right out of the academy um, we've already exhausted the current eligibility list and plan on testing again on Sunday, October 23rd with the Civil Service Commission. The advertisement went out this week. Um, it will be the fourth police officer exam that we will have given in 18 months, which I've been here for 10 years and I could tell you that is unprecedented. Yeah. 
a municipality to the east of us who just advertised and tested and typically get 60 plus to respond had two show up for testing. We advertise on job sites, social media, we're recruiting at local colleges and universities. Until recently, a prerequisite for this department has been that any applicant who applies would have already had to have completed municipal police training, which is Act 120. So if you hear me say Act 120, that's the six month police training program. And um, in most cases, most people who go through a municipal police academy, they, they pay their own way through. They're not sponsored or paid for by the department. The testing and hiring process isn't cheap and we're not achieving the desired results. Police Academy enrollment is down significantly, and the majority of classes that haven't been canceled are usually filled with police cadets who've got jobs waiting for them and have been sponsored by a police department. Um, the last time around, we visited four academies, Temple, Redding, Monco, Delco, and the majority of those classes really weren't fertile ground for recruiting because most most of them already had jobs waiting for them. Um, the pandemic, and we've talked about this before, the pandemic and the post George Floyd area has just created the perfect storm. I, I've been in this profession now for 38 years, and I could tell you nationally we are just in a recruiting and retention crisis. I've, I've never seen anything quite like it. The last time our township paid to put people through the training was 19 years ago. We haven't had to do it since. Um, but respectfully, I think in 2023, we need to budget to do that again, especially if the class that we're giving, or the tests that we're giving on October 23rd, doesn't produce the results we're looking for, where we don't have enough qualified applicants who have already gone through and, and achieved Act 120 certification. Um, the manager and I have, have talked about this quite a bit recently. If we have to pay to train, we'll be reimbursed by the state 75% of the training costs and 45% of the applicant's salary while they're, they're, they're in training. And then we would have to have some type of written agreement in place with the applicant to protect the township's investment in the event right. they dropped out of training, something happened. Um, so I don't know if I, I missed anything that you wanted to add, but that's kind of the state of the union. Any questions? Commissioners, any questions? I know it's a difficult time now. For it really is. To hire. But uh, glad we have the three new ones, three new candidates yes. this week. Three. Hopefully they uh, enjoy their time here at Cal, and hopefully they can spread the word. I uh, hopefully they're. Yeah, well, I had I had I had this discussion with some of them today. The the best recruiting tools that we have are our own people. Mm -hmm. um, so, word of mouth. Word of mouth. Thank you, Chief. I, I, we've exhausted all options for advertisement. I mean, we, we, it, it is what it is. So. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. All right. All right. Thank, thank you, Chief. You. All right. Thanks. Thank the the only thing I would add, Chief, is is the the one um, kind of silver lining in this very dark cloud is you know some people it, you know it's a significant expense to go to the police academy. Some people have part-time ability. Most of the academies are full-time, you know, to put out that type of money and not know if you're gonna have a job. Um, in communities that they allow for, that they provide the Act 120 training, it does help with minority recruitment. Um, so that is the one silver lining we do hope comes out of this. Um, yeah. Is that someone who may not normally be able to afford this, um, this is a, a great opportunity. Um, to have that ability so that that is one of um, one of the the many you know one of the things we are hoping comes out of it. Okay. what do you recruit for that from colleges or um, actually I just re reached out to 
um, the state reps office today and, okay. and was going to talk with them um, about any ideas that they have um, that, you know, it, it would be great if we could get some, some local kids that, you know, grew up in the Coatesville area, they're familiar kind of with the streets in the area. Um, so I was going to pick their brains about, you know, networks that they have. Um, you know, one network we've, we've never been able to really tap into is um, the Hispanic League network. Um, so if anybody has any, you know, contacts, please mm. pass them on. We, we would love to be able to share this. And um, we'll also share it on the NAACP that is, link. That, that was, was, I was, was just, that. actually, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say, Jane, you know, I know you have some contacts with the NAACP. Mm -hmm. We would that really, would be good to really, put it on our website there. Yes, we would really appreciate that. What um, about the juvenile detention center? I mean, like, I'm really serious. Like, there are kids that are out there, you know, that don't have opportunities. And... It, it, it really is a great mm -hmm. opportunity for them to have a career. Um, and, you know, a lot of these kids just may not have known what a civil service test is or known, you know, what the process is to be, become a police officer and just thinks it's something out of their reach. And, and this brings this closes that gap and brings it a lot closer. So among the colleges and universities where we're actively recruiting are Cheney and Lincoln members. Cheney and Lincoln. And we have in the past, but to the manager's point, you know, it, it, it's at least six to $7,000 out of pocket, to put yourself through right. a municipal police academy. A criminal, and um, that hasn't been okay. an option here for a long time. So I, I think we've lost a good portion of our audience when we, when we try to actively recruit at those institutions, which I think if, if we're willing to pay, I think we will, we hopefully will have Some better interest. turnout yeah. and more interest. That would help. All right, I like Thank you. it. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Next, we have the uh, fire department chief Taylor, Patrick. How are you this evening? Good. How is everybody? I was getting some flashbacks. Not so good. <laughs> Mentioned a certain storm from a year ago. So. <laughs> yeah. And I know, I know what's going on in Dallas and down south and. Wow. And, and yeah, yeah, Kentucky. So it's uh, and there's a Caribbean storm coming through this weekend. You're not going, are you? No. Oh, okay. No, but I'm just saying there there is a storm brewing <laughs> over the Caribbean coming mm. in this weekend. So well, hopefully no. you know, we need the rain, <laughs> but not anything like that. Not a um, so as I digress from that, um, just kind of want to mention uh, we're coming into a busy time of year, especially uh, fire prevention. Um, public ed education officer Kim Madsen does. Uh, in my opinion, a phenomenal program for this township. Um, I know uh, Mr. Kennedy, <laughs> she comes out every year. She's already uh, gone this past week to your facility. Um, but so that that's kind of starting while Fire Prevention Week is, is typically one week in October. It's several months long for uh, Thorndale. Uh, we do take great pride in, in that program. Um, and with Kim being nationally certified for fire prevention, it's, it's definitely a huge benefit. And we really appreciate everything she does. Um, so that schedule is really becoming much, much longer. She's reaching out to all the schools, elementary schools and things like that, um, in addition to the daycares, uh, so that uh, she's going to have a busy couple months coming up. Um, and as always, our fire prevention open house will be held during fire prevention week on that Wednesday. Uh, you can always visit our Facebook page or our website for more information on that. Um, and then the final thing I just want to mention is we teamed up with uh, Serve Pro of Kennett and Oxford to do a shredding event. Um, so I believe it's up to five boxes. Um, and that will be held on September 17th at Coatesville High School. Um, so if you have a bunch of stuff to shred, uh, you'll see some uh, hopefully familiar faces from the fire department. And, and uh, they'll, they'll get all that clutter off your hands. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for uh, Patrick? All right. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, next, we have uh, Ingleside Golf Manager, Mr. Ward. Chris, how are you tonight? How are you? Unbelievable. <laughs> Talk of storms, kind of rubbing it in because I could really use some rain right now myself. <laughs> so, um, I'll go over the July numbers here. Uh, July was another really good month, um, our best July that we've had since wow. we're in the golf course. Uh, rounds were 4,062. Compared to last year, 3,634, mm. so about 400 more. Uh, July's revenue, 131,791, compared to last year, 121,609, so about 10,000 more 
50 percent uh, year to date we're at 536 862 compared to last year 527 972 about 9,000 more two percent up that's a, a good comparison because last year was our biggest year ever so we're even building on top of that mm -hmm. um, currently we're about 220,000 up this year um, to the overall golf fund as mentioned earlier about 45 to 50,000 up um, and that includes about two million that you know has been we will have a payment of 124,000 coming up so we will go back in the negative but if we do what we did last year we'll end up being in the black at the end of this year and that includes a payment of two million dollars that we've paid for the loan since we've owned the golf wow. fund. so it's looking good right now it's going well um with that you know we have i got this weekend was able to get updated quotes on the equipment that we were looking to get for 2023 possible mm -hmm. equipment um one was the golf carts that's the one that changed price wise the 55 golf carts um delivery now as early as spring of next year um it would be a seven-year lease with monthly payments of two thousand three hundred ninety five dollars and next year we would only be paying 14372 because of delivery date so after that between 2024 and 29 it'd be 28744 that would be our, our yearly payment um and then in 2030 we would finish out with another 14372 would finish out the seven year lease. total cost of that lease would be two hundred one thousand two hundred fourteen dollars if you add up all those payments um the next mower the next piece of equipment was the greens mower um saying these are all going to come spring at earliest um total cost of that is forty thousand nine oh five finance for three years and that would be a payment for the year would be fourteen thousand nine eight nine. And then the last one was that rough mower, uh, cost fifty one thousand seven hundred seventy five dollars three years, and that would be eighteen nine eight four over those three years. And those those prices did not change on those bills, mainly those cards. So I, like I said, I got them late and on the weekend. I was finally able to get them from everybody and have them out there. So um, other than that, we have that, and that's all I have. Chris, it's it's Mark. I've got a couple of questions um, yeah. on your. Uh, projections that I'm looking at here. You're, you're showing uh, 2023 and 2024 projected revenue and expenses and then um, uh, projected margin on them. Uh, are, do those numbers include the uh, expenditures that you're for the uh, golf carts and the mowers? Yeah, that's all included in there. Yeah. And those numbers are based on 23,000 rounds. We're doing that's kind of our break even point. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to do in the last three years 26 to 28,000. And there's no risk what? seeing us slowing down right now. So, really, that's based upon our, our break even point for budgeting. Well, that's good. That's always the best way to do it. That way, you're happily surprised later. Um, I, I know that at the last meeting, um, I had expressed some concerns I had that the plan didn't you know it was it was just dependent on raising uh fees right. and right. and that that's that's not a sustainable model and i want to see this as a success and i had said that marketing getting a marketing plan together was going to be very important social media aspect fixing the website um and i offered to help um with that I haven't heard from you. I'm. Sh I know you're busy, but do you have my email address? Do you? You said you would take my help then, but I haven't heard from you. So we, we've been talking about marketing plan going forward, and we do have a plan that we've talked about a little bit with the committee that mm -hmm. we can like talk about and go a little bit further into that. Um, it has to do more of how we go about with the staff that we have, which is me and JT doing. Um, it was mentioned at one time, and this is just thrown out there of maybe a marketing manager coming in that could help us to promote work to cash register. And like I said, we mentioned this a little bit, and I'd like to look into that a little bit more of something to help us out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, me and JT are two people covering about four or five positions. Um, I understand. That's why me, who's already stretched pretty thin, had said, I'll help you. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and, and I know that Commissioner Mullen had, had asked that you work with um lisa swan on this at the last meeting too that the more heads we get together on this 
the faster we can get it implemented and yep. without taking away from the actual functioning of the golf course. Uh, because I know Lisa wants to help and I know I want to help. When was the last golf committee meeting? Last one was before our meeting. Well, uh, right before, about two days before our la last meeting. No, I was at the last meeting. Our of next July. meeting, Mark, is on um, Monday, Monday, I believe. Yeah. Monday. Okay. This Monday. Cool. Okay. Um, that All right. So, yeah, it's, it, it, you know, that wiping out all of that negative fund is, is amazing. It's just, you know, we got to keep, we can't just be stagnant with this. We have to look with new eyes and, and get new ideas out there because there's, there's probably 25% uh, out of increase out there that we can get by just using marketing properly. Oh, yeah. So, so just you know, at this time of year, and the most important thing for a golf course is keeping the golf course in good shape. That word gets out. If you go into battery, that word gets out and not over. And that right now, that's our main, you know, been focusing a lot on yeah. that. We and JT have been talking about things that we can do. Um, and those things with the golf committee in a meeting on Monday that we were coming, bringing ideas. All right. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Mark. Uh, any other questions for Chris? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Next, we have a uh, director of building and life safety and public works, uh, Mr. Stackhouse Ray. How are you tonight, Commissioner? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, I'll try to uh, focus just on some highlights, but but it's been a busy month um, for both uh, code enforcement and public works. But uh, the Lomax property, uh, what what we consider Phase One, which is really the uh, grading, site work, and some of the stormwater inlets in front of the building. That work actually is uh, getting ready to start. That'll probably start in the next week or two. As part of that project, um, some some long-term repairs to that back access drive are part of that. Mm -hmm. There'll be some milling and overlay as opposed to just patching. Uh, it won't be the entire drive, but the large portions will actually be mil you know, repaired, milled, and overlaid. So like I said, that, that project, uh, to do just that work will probably start within the next couple of weeks and uh, should be done fairly quickly. Uh, Aldi uh, received their building permit, so they're starting to start doing the work <clears throat> renovation in the Aldi section and the interior of Lomax, they're looking at potentially a soft opening probably sometime late September. Uh, a couple other projects that will be coming to the commissioners sometime probably in September is CCIU is doing a what they call a toddler center. There's a toddler center on the CCIU campus now. It's basically a modular home. Uh, they provide daycare for, for students um, that go to the CCIU programs. They're expanding that program a little bit and they need to update that building. So they're doing the land development project. They did get recommendation from the planning commission uh, at the planning commission August uh, meeting to move forward. Colonial Hyundai. Colonial Hyundai is doing a land development. Um, they're doing some uh, additions to their building. Um, and that review is in progress. Uh, we actually just issued the review back to them. And all fill 4060 Edges Mill Road uh, needs to do a conditional use for a land development project they want to do. Um, that conditional use review was just completed and issued back to them. Uh, COVID. <clears throat> we talked about COVID several times, and it's it's interesting because I got con I was contacted by FEMA just recently and had what's called a closeout meeting for our COVID grant. Uh, back in 2020, we did file for you know COVID uh, COVID related uh, reimbursement from FEMA. We received some of those funds initially in 2021, and now we actually just did the closeout and. Uh, looking to hopefully receive a few uh, thousand dollars more to cover some of the expenses that we incurred during those critical times in 2020 and 2021. Uh, Ida, I heard it mentioned a couple times, I really don't wanna think about that either, but uh, unfortunately weekly, 
uh, we're, we're reminded of it just based on the work. Uh, we continue to have our weekly meetings with TEMA. Uh, we are submitting uh, project information on a weekly basis to FEMA. And that, you know, obviously that'll continue through next year. <clears throat> just to expand a little bit on two projects that Casey mentioned from Arrow, the golf course uh, demo of the, of the building. Um, actually, the contractor was uh, scheduled to mobilize and we recognize that there's public water still to the building. Uh, we had anticipated that it was well water. We did not realize there was still public water there. Uh, then when I had Pennsylvania American Water come out, they cannot find the curb stop. Um, I was out with them the other day. They started tracing the lines and it looks like the curb stop is somewhere between the building and all the way back up on Horseshoe Drive. Um, so they're out there and going to start doing exploratory digging and try to, you know, do something to cut off the water to that building so that we can get that demo going. Road program, I just received an update from the contractor two days ago or a day ago. And actually, August 29th, they will be mobilizing on Seltzer Avenue to start the stormwater work along Seltzer Avenue that has to take place prior to the milling and overlaying. So um, that should start August 29th. Uh, from a public works perspective, uh, the, the crew, the crew that we have, and I say that because we're still short for, for staff, well, it'll be three as of Monday since the commissioners approved the MOU with the union. Um, they're doing stormwater, you know, maintenance, stormwater projects. Uh, they've been working with Abby and doing some park projects and planning. And we continue to find stormwater systems along the uh, Geo Carlson section that you know, we're, we're in the process of getting uh, quotes to hopefully budget for those projects next year. Um, that's all I have at this moment. Thanks, Ray. It's Mark. I, I have a yeah. question. Um, you mentioned the all fill uh, conditional use. Uh, package. I know that in November, the Historical Commission had sent uh, a lengthily detailed uh, request for consideration to all fill, uh, which they didn't respond to. And it was, there was nothing in the packet that we saw um, this time around in response to that. Do you know if they've been working on a response to that or if they just absolutely are going to ignore it? And uh, which I, would not be cool. <laughs> not, and I, I'll be honest with you, I do not believe they will ignore it. Uh, in, in our review letter for the conditional use review, we uh -huh. pointed that out. We included your letter. We included that they did not respond to that and they did need to respond to that. Um, I'm glad, and I do apologize. I should have brought this up. I was contacted on Tuesday uh, by the legal counsel for all fill. And mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, uh, I, yesterday, uh, they were supposed to meet with at least two or three of the property owners at the site to discuss um, what the what they're doing there and uh, what their intent is there. So on two folds, number one, like I said, we did say they had to respond to the planning commission I mean, the historical commission in our review letter. And I do know that they, if nothing else, did schedule a meeting with uh, the surrounding neighbors to discuss, you know, what their plans are there. Yeah, that's great. I, I wish that they had actually contacted the historical commission and asked if any of us would be there because, um, you know, if someone sends me a letter, you know, I'm going to respond to it. And if I ignore it for nine months, that's an insult. And if they are reminded of it and they don't respond, that's a second insult. And then if they invite other people to meet at the grounds and nobody who sent them the letter, that's, you know, I won't even use the two letters that that describes what they're saying to us. So, um, I mean, the people who own those properties, they're, they have an investment in it. But this was a historical commission matter um, that they really needed to respond to us. So I appreciate everything you're doing, but maybe you could give them a little nudge um, because I know the pre the president of the historical commission is not happy with this. And I know the secretary who is the guy speaking right now is not happy with this. So, um, 
you know, if we take the time to write a really nice letter and we don't hear anything back, that's that's not cool. So, and I'm cranky, but this is my night to be cranky. So, thanks, Ray. That, that, that's all right. I, I am supposed to contact our legal counsel. Uh, I did mm -hmm. have a message from him when I get back, and he mm -hmm. was supposed to tell me how his meeting went. That was what his message on my phone was, and I mm -hmm. will certainly remind him of the requirement to satisfy the historical commission's comments. Hey, can I ask a question, a favor? You know, this is just the way I do, you know. Yes, sir. I know that a couple of the residents have done things by phone that, you know, have blown up on them later. Maybe when you speak to the legal counsel, uh, if you can ask them to send you a summary, an email of what happened so that we'll have record of that. Sure. I have no problems with that. I appreciate that, sir. I really do. And I know you're way too busy for all this other, for all this nonsense, but I appreciate it. No, no, no. It's part of, part of the process. All right, man. Hope you're feeling better. Uh, I'm getting there as well. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right, Ray. Appreciate the report. Uh, any other questions for Ray? Right, I'll open up to uh, public uh, questions uh, for any of the directors. Is it Spalding? Cheryl. I'm sorry, can I ask, do you want to wait till public comments or is this it? <laughs> well, is it uh, for the director's reports? Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about the golf course and I won't drag this out into a long involved conversation about money or whatever, but I do, I think Mark, Mark pretty much hit the head on the nail. It's time for some really new thinking about the golf course overall. Um, and I actually have a question that I believe uh, Commissioner Josh uh, Young can answer. Josh, a couple times over the past couple of years, it has been talked about or bantered about, if you will, that there was a potential to, an idea, if you will, to turn the golf course into a nine-hole course and then take the rest of it and make it into a park. My question to you is, was that ever seriously pursued? So if it was, what was the result of that? And secondly, are you aware of any restrictions or things that would stand in the way of that happening? So when we purchased the course, we hired a consultant to help us transition the golf course into our hands mm -hmm. and help us with that. Um, we, we looked at two things. First, at, at one point, the school district approached us about the front half uh, of the golf course where the ponds are, about building a new Callan Elementary there, mm -hmm. uh, and then us transitioning the back half to a nine-hole course. Um, we worked with our consultant. Basically, nine-hole courses don't make any money. No. Um, and we didn't have, the reason the Westchester nine-hole course works is one, it's Westchester, and two, it has a food operation and a banquet facility. Um, and that's where they make their money. Um, and basically everybody's a member there because if you're part of county government or, or you know, things like that, everybody's a member. So we, we did consider, seriously consider a nine hole course, just either a parkland or at one point we talked, we were in discussion with the school district about a, a school but, on the front half. But I'm, um, I'm misunderstanding you. That was back in what, 2000? 2007. Okay. Um, there are deed restrictions on the property. There are also wetland restrictions. And um, Ms. Camp's not here anymore, but there, there are a couple restrictions on that, as well as easement restrictions. Um, the uh, first tee, the cart barn, the old cart barn, and I believe some of the fairway on the first hole is, is part of the craft house's property. Um, and we have a right to use that with an easement. Um, so we don't own all of that property up, up front there along North Valley Road. Um, and the other thing is the bondholders uh, granted those bonds based on the use. So we would probably have to go back to the bondholders and renegotiate our bond. You talk about the county? No, the county gave us no money for them. Uh, because oh, okay. It, so the actual bondholders that hold the debt 
we would have to renegotiate with them. Okay, but there's the reason I say this to you is there are a couple things about this, you know, and as you well know, this has been rolling around with me for a long time. But you know, when you purchased the golf course in twenty what twenty two thousand two thousand seven two thousand seven. Callan Township was not nearly so densely populated as it is now. You know, we had a lot of farms and places that hadn't been developed. There's a lot of, whether it was owned by the township or not owned by the township, there was a lot of open space land laying around in this township. That is not the case anymore. Um, and I think, and I'm hearing from people as well, and it's not just me. Um, you know, the golf course is fine, but it's not a business. It, oscillates wildly back and forth between being in the hole deeply or just gra just crawling out of the hole. Um, and in truth, you know, you've got this giant hunk of land there that township residents can't use. They can't walk on it. They can't take a dog on it. They can't do anything on it. It's, it's totally sitting there as if it, it, almost, it, it's almost like it's not what it, it's not what it is. It's not a golf course. It's not a park. It's not a business. Uh, Ms. Bowling, it's, not a yeah, I, I it's a golf course. It's a golf course for residents and non-residents to be able to play golf on it. Okay, I would. A, I would love. And, and we to do know. have other open uh, spaces in our township, and we yeah. are trying to elaborate with our Spackman Farm to create a walking uh, trail or, or more open space for our residents. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, but this golf course, and, and let me point out a few things to you, Cheryl. You know, you, you post on, on your on your Facebook page that uh, it, it, tax dollars are paying for this course, which is not true. This course is being paid by itself, by the money, the income that is created by by the uh, the golf games. Okay, we are actually to the point of seeing black finally. Okay, that, that means it's making the money. It's paying for itself. It's also paying for the loan that we originally took out. And yes, you, you had mentioned that this loan has been refinanced several times, but it's been refinanced in the past to get a lower rate to save our residents the money for that. And also the, you know, for the, uh, for the cost for the golf course. So, you know, the, the golf course, you know, back in 2007, this board wasn't there. We didn't, except for Josh, we had no say, but we have this golf course and we have been diligently going after it and we have lowered the debt or, you know, the golf fund debt from uh, at, at worst case scenario, 657 in the negative, 657,000 down to a positive at this point. And hopefully as it was, uh, uh, you know, proposed earlier, we may be what 50 to 75,000 ahead at the end of this year. That additional cost, that additional income that we have, we are going to use to improve this course, improve it by the carts, improve it by the, the lawn care. Okay. And all that money is being reinvested. So it's not a tax to the, you know, it's not well, taxing it, our residents. The, the 650, $657,000 that was in the hole. Yes. That didn't come out of thin air. That was tax money. That didn't come out of what? That was township funds. Yes, it is. It, it is a fund. But it's it's the golf fund. It's it's like the the revenue and and you know income and uh, law statement. Oh, I understand. Are you okay. saying to me that the six hundred fifty thousand dollars? We were in a hole fund, for six hundred fifty-seven thousand taxes. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, the, the, okay, you've got a fund. It has six hundred. It had, you know it had six hundred fifty-seven thousand dollars. That money was not funded by taxes. Is that what you're saying? No, we were in the hole as far as the for the township. Yeah, but and the golf great. course itself has been paying it back, getting it back into the uh, the black. I understand. So ultimately, this golf course is paying for itself and also paying for that, yes. uh, you know, for the original loan. You know, and just to point this out, I mean, if we if we scratch the whole golf course idea, and make it public land, uh, we still have a debt on that, which would end up being being taken out of our tax. So so residents would be paying for the remainder of that loan instead of having a golf course actually pay for it. And once that, once that loan is paid for, it's ours. You know, this township owns that golf course. It, How much money is owed? Now that I don't know off the top of my head. Hold on. 
but let's let's go back to this one the two things uh you had said earlier that it's uh it, it it oscillates wildly on on the you know from the red to the black since we took a took office in 2020 at that first meeting we made the challenge to turn it around we started a golf committee in those under three years the let's call it since you want to say it's taxpayer funded let's say the taxpayers lent six hundred thousand dollars to get that golf course going and it has paid that debt back in those three years you know if we can't look you know i took i was not a big fan of the golf course three years ago i wasn't a big fan of it two years ago but i can step back and look at the big picture now and say you know what this is working this is turning around and if we put our focus on the areas of open space where we really can make them magical things, if we get some people working together, we'll be in a much better place. Having a golf course in a township that is about to explode is a very good thing. Why? Why? Yeah. Because Why? the businesses that we're gonna be attracting on Lincoln Highway and the people investing through Lerda are going to want facilities. And not everybody wants to go over to uh, the Downingtown Golf Course, which I think is a bunch of snobbery over there. This golf course here reminds me of Ironstone, where I played with my dad as a kid. It was a public course. It's where everyone, everybody could go and play. The people, the working class, rubbing elbows with the you know the ceos that's why this township is not going to stay the graveyard and dump that it was allowed to become over time everything we're doing right now is moving it forward and i know you know it because i know you see the things that i post oh i i don't disagree we're moving forward at all yeah. mark and i and i think we are but I remain skeptical, skeptical about the golf course because mainly because, you know, at the same time that 600,000, and I'm not blaming this on you because you guys came in when you came in, mm -hmm. so go backwards for a few seconds. During the 17 years that the Spackman Farm has sat there, mm -hmm. money, was, money was loaned to the golf course, if you want to put it that way, loaned to the golf course. If that money, had been put into Spackman Farm, we'd already have a Spackman, uh, we'd have a Spackman Park. We didn't What's happening at Spackman Farm right now, Sean? Oh, you're finally going to be able to do something with it after well, seven You know, we can years. sit and say, what if you should have, you should have, or look, we're doing this now. It may not have been done the way that we all would have liked all along, but it's happening now. Well, so instead of question. looking back and saying, question. I mean, what really? If? Let me, let me ask you a separate What question. if you got a group of people to come to the Historical Commission and help out with the Spackman Farm Project? Would you do that? Would you go on your site and say, and ask. people, Tell get involved, join the Historical Commission, start a uh, 501c3? Would you do those things? Because if you do... Put it out there and I'll put it out there. But, but here's my question, Mark. And it's really for all mm -hmm. the board members. What if the people in this township were to come to you and say, okay, I like all your great ideas about the golf course, whatever, but we really want a park. What are you going to do then? Well, they've got a park coming in at Spackman Farm right now. And you know what? If the people want, the people are going to get what they want. Okay, that's fair. People are always going to get what they want. That's this is fair. a democracy. But they're getting a park there. And, you know, there's another place we could have a park that I haven't given up on yet. So... Let's keep moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank thanks you very much for the comments. And really good, good you know, stuff, if, Cheryl. You know, Ms. Spalding, if we were still in the hole for 400 or 600,000, you know, this would be a different conversation. And, and this is Absolutely. where, you know, you had a lot of great comments in the very beginning of this, but now we are actually turning around the golf course. We've really made headway and it is paying for itself. Uh, so I, I don't see as you, as you put it there, it's a, 
a thorn in our side financially here at the township, which I don't believe anymore. It, it may have been three years ago and, and further back, but now it's turning around, it's doing something for this township and it's not a burden to our tax uh, payers. So, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, we can move on to additional business. You have one more person with the oh. hand up. Oh, we have another hand raised. I missed that. Mr. DeYoung. Yes. Mark, how Hello, are you? Hello, everyone. Hey, Mark. Not, not to, and I'll go very short with this. Um, there might have been somebody before me, but I remember standing on that floor about three years ago talking about the golf course, saying, I'm not going away. <laughs> until we get this thing done. And in that time, the numbers that Mark reflected, that I think we're even more positive. I think we're further behind at that time to the golf fund. Now, it may have been a little naive because I didn't know about the, the bond out there. So financial um, illiteracy on my part there. But anyway, the golf course has made progress. But we need to keep together and move it forward. Yeah, who thought it would be back to a in the black? Um, certainly not me, but I got involved. I, I try to push as hard as I can, and we've seen considerable progress. And at the point now, we're paying down a fund. If we can own this thing, then it's all profit. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's a waste down the road, but it's all profit. Um, so I think we need a little more tweaks. We need a little more narrative, uh, as Mark talked about, to you know the business plan going forward. However, I also think we need to move forward on the equipment that the golf course needs to order now in order to start going forward. And we're in the financial position finally to do that. I don't want to ride in the golf cart with a hole through the window. Okay, I, I play over there. And I pay my money. I bought a membership. I got involved from Murray, which way I could. So, you know, three years ago, I want that thing mismanaged by somebody else. I wanted it sold. I stood on the floor of that building and said the same things. And here I'm telling you a different story. It is making progress. Could it be better? Anything could be better. So absolutely. But I think we need to write a nice narrative of what is the point the golf course is now? What is our future? And, and I don't think you can portray out the five years, to be honest with you, on a golf course. Um, you know, banks, when we ask for information from a loan applicant, we ask for three years. Because they can't drag five years. It, yeah. It's a thing going across the board. So I might have gone long, long and I wanted to. Um, I'm in support of what is ha happening now. I want to make the purchases so we can keep the people coming now. And I just want to move forward next year and pay down the bond, make more money, make more rounds. As Chris said, we're, you know, the part that was, was kind of missed in this whole subject was he's projecting it on the average of 23,000 rounds and we're getting closer to 28,000 rounds. Exactly. That is huge. Yes. That's where your money is. Not You can't raise the prices every year. Well, you can. I mean, a buck or two. But, you know, you can't raise revenue a buck a you know, year on the golf fees. But if you can increase golfers, you got a whole, whole other set. So mm -hmm. thank you for listening, and that's just for, for my input. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, much, Mark. Really, you know, and, and thank you for all you're doing here. Thanks. And thank you thank for being involved. That's the most yes. important part of this township. It, it takes folks like you that make this thing work. So, all right, hey, Mr. President. My wife's telling me it's time for the birthday cake downstairs. <laughs> almost almost all right uh, additional business Did not see any hands raised uh, public comment any public comment at this time just a quick i guess oh i missed my unmute for um 
additional business. Are we, what are we doing with the golf course proposal? Is that on the agenda? Is that on next agenda? Like what, what are we doing? Uh, the golf committee we're meeting on Monday and then we can uh, present it at our, at our next meeting. Cause we want to try to make a move okay. on this, on the golf course, uh, or I'm sorry, the golf carts. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Any other public comment? Not at this time. All right. Uh, I will entertain a motion to, uh, for adjournment. So moved. Moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great Thank night. Thank you, everyone. Bye. All right. Bye now.